Okay, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Ben Wandout from the Institute of Astrophysics in Paris, the Lagrange Institute, and the Center for Computational Astrophysics of the Flat Iron uh, Institute. Uh, ben received his PhD from Imperial College London and was on the faculty of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign before moving to Paris, where he is now the International Chair of Theoretical Physics and Director of the Lagrange Institute. Uh, since a few years ago, he has been spending some time on our side of the pond as Senior Research Scientist at the Flatiron Institute. Uh, ben has made many wide-ranging contributions to astrophysics and cosmology. He is very well known to the cosmology community for his role uh, in the Planck experiment uh, and his work on non-Gaussianity and cosmic voids. Uh, he's an expert in developing statistical and computational methods for cosmology. We are very excited to hear from him today about how physics meets ML uh, can solve cosmological inference. So take it away, Ben. Thank you, Gary, for the very kind introduction. Let me just say it's a pleasure to be here and, um, uh, and thank you for organizing uh, the series because obviously now there's uh, it fills a real need in the community. So great. Um, so let me get started. Um, none of this work, let me just pre preface this by saying none of this work would have been possible without these uh, collaborators. Um, and in fact, you'll meet some more uh, along the way. Niall Jeffrey, for example, who I just realized is not listed here, but uh, um, he'll, he'll come, come up uh, later on. Um, so uh, th this audience is quite a broad audience. I don't need to. I don't need to think. I need to spend a lot of time uh, about setting this for, to set the stage uh, for, cos for what cosmology is. Um, but let me just just say that um, really, we're, I'm going to be talking about a fairly general problem, which is cosmological inference. It's a big problem with many pieces. Um, and uh, really the ambition is to uh, solve the following problem, to understand um, the content, the origin, content, um, and evolution and dynamics of our universe um, and its fate um, by using physical models that we uh, confront with astronomical data sets and of course, labor laboratory physics, um, a combination of those. Um, and, and this is really uh, the problem I'm talking about. Um, this could take many forms, the astronomical data I'm talking about, um, some of them are listed there on the left. Um, we're really talking about a, a, a project that in its logical conclusion would take all of the information available to us, so which is in our on the surface of mostly, but also in our past light cone and, um, and use it to learn about these, um, these questions that I just listed. So um, this is an ambitious problem, but we are in the perfect time to really think about this problem. And let me tell you why. So here uh, we all know that uh, cosmology is, is Experience still experiencing an exponential explosion of data, which is um, which is really key for this. Um, if I, I did the exercise once, I think since the mid '90s, um, there's been a steady exponential growth of cosmological data, both in the CMB and I've seen it actually longer. It goes longer back longer, but actually maybe it's even a longer history. But it's the the growth is still accelerating. Uh, so there's inflation also in, on the data side in cosmology. Um, and I'm just putting up a smattering of, of surveys here. Some have already been completed, others uh, are ongoing and, and yet others uh, are about to get, get started. And um, we, we live really in a, and I know this, when you have an exponential growth, then it's always true that you live at a special time. <laughs> well, the, uh, because something really sig significant is going to happen next. Um, and uh, in particular, through various delays and, and planning coincidences, we're um, now at a stage where in about two to three years, several really major surveys, astronomical surveys are going to come online and start uh, producing data and, and sharing it with the entire community. So Euclid is one of them. 
Um, LSST is another. Um, the dark energy, so DESI, um, um, and um, um, and Spherex as, as well, actually, I should have, which isn't even mentioned here. So this is really just a, um, uh, so DESI is the dark energy spectroscopic instrument. It's also represented here. Um, so, and, and they're going to be uh, groundbreaking and produce just an enormous amount of data, which, which, um, which we hope to be able to use. So um, just for those of you who are not cosmologists, um, let me just give you an overview of the range of scales that uh, we can probe on this light cone. So the light cone is there in the little insert on the left. And what I'm showing you here uh, is the cosmic microwave background, which is a, um, a, you know, a slice through that light cone at early times. Uh, where we can see the gravitational potential um, processed through plasma physics. Um, and uh, then I've zoomed in approximately keeping the scales correct, uh, showing um, the, the range of scales that, you know, that you traverse, uh, basically going through, when you sort of zoom into a patch and you zoom into a patch, a small patch again, then you get to the scale of uh, cur current scale of galaxy surveys. Um, and if you keep zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, then eventually you get to the scale of the cosmic web, which is the lowest, uh, this, this little box here on the lower right. And, um, you know, one of those galaxies, actually that one, the green one there, that is uh, the Milky Way. So, um, um, so this, let me, let me again uh, say what I mean with this cosmological inference problem. So the cosmological inference problem really is taking the initial conditions of the universe. So some process that created the, uh, the initial conditions. Um, so for example, inflation um, produces this, uh, this a 3D uh, slice through this at some early time in, the, in, the, um, in our past light cone lays down perturbations um, and you know, inflation that's, uh, those have quantum origins. They're parameterized, they the public perturbations themselves, which I'm showing you a visual representation of here in terms of this sphere. Can you see the cursor when I'm moving it? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, this, this, this sphere of initial conditions, which is a slice through that uh, light cone. We are at the center um, and these perturbations are parameterized I'm showing scalar perturbations, but there are in inflation, for example, there would also be tensor perturbations at some level. Um, and they're parameterized by some numbers, um, including their deviations from, Gauss, non, from Gaussianity, which are also expected in inflation and uh, at, as a small level. And of course, in, in some other models at a, at a stronger level. Um, and so even in single field inflation is what I mean, even, but, it, but in other models, even more so. Um, and then there is a, a there's physics basically that takes all of that and um, with some parameters, for example, cosmic content, the dynamics of uh, you know some some model for the acceleration of the universe, um, physical parameters like the neutrino mass, um, turn, turns that into what we can observe. So just showing some. Uh, some images here that are meant to represent the large variety of possible observations that we have of the distribution of matter in the universe, um, of our, our local photon um, distribution that reflects, uh, you know, the, the microwave photons that have that have that come from um, the last scattered in the very early universe. Okay, so that's uh, so that's all about forward modeling. That's so, so. This is the physics part, and so now what we want to do is to go backwards. We we want to go, start from these observations, from these photons, essentially, but maybe in some processed form, into catalogs in, in some some summarized form that makes this a little more convenient, and then turn it around and then find out what the initial conditions were, what are the, and what the parameters for the dynamics of the universe were. Um, Okay, so the goals of this is to learn about the cosmic beginning, cosmic content, the dynamics, cosmic fate, and uh, those are related to, so this, this means initial conditions, means studying the growth of perturbations, it means studying the dynamics of, uh, you know, which are related to, um, to that. 
and studying the expansion geometry of the universe. So this allows us to uh, characterize this very mysterious um, cosmic acceleration that the universe is experiencing. Um, okay, so uh, here's a summary of the talk. So there are many pieces here. I'm not going to uh, not going to go through everything, but um, just to give you a sense that uh, over the last few years, we've developed a number of different tools. Um, and a lot of it is based on machine learning innovations, but also new physical insights, some simulation innovations, um, and methods for comparing data with theory um, that, uh, that can address this problem. And, um, and it, of course, not in its entire generality at first, but what we're looking at are really successive approximations. And, and I've outlined the end goal on the previous slides. So let's start with the initial conditions, which maybe you might think of as maybe the hard, hardest problem, but in, but in some ways actually it's, well, um, if you can make some approximations along the way, it's not really that crazy. Okay, so let's, let's start with this. Um, so um, the goal is to reconstruct the initial conditions, the 3D, this 3D object that I showed you there that led after all the processing to the observed matter distribution in the universe today and at various redshifts where we have observations. So we call this, uh, a, this is a forward model. So um, meaning that we are running forward simulations. Um, it's a probabilistic forward model, meaning that actually we're very, um, we're able to constrain these simulations on data and everything is set up so that uh, when we constrain the simulations on data, then the initial conditions that are explored by the simulator are those initial conditions that lead to the, that can plausibly lead to the data that we observe. Uh, and they will be distributed in the correct way. So this is, we call this Bayesian origin reconstruction from galaxies or Borg. And the idea is that we're able to assimilate all kinds of information uh, and then explore the, the constraints within, uh, explore the parameters within those constraints. So uh, here we're taking uh, typically a Gaussian prior for the initial conditions. We add a nonlinear gravity model um, and then a model that relates the nonlinearly evolved matter distribution um, today to the galaxy catalog that we uh, use. Okay, so that's a likelihood. Um, and there's a, there's a bias model. I'm mentioning some things that, that go into this. Um, the way we explore the parameters given a catalog of galaxies um, is using a Hamiltonian Markov chain method. And you have a very large number of parameters here, uh, millions, tens of millions of parameters, because every single voxel of the initial condition is a parameter and it's non-linearly related to, um, to the observables and non-Gaussianly related to the observables. But you can write down this likelihood prescription and obviously there are some assumptions in, in the bias model and um, uh, and in the likelihood that they have from these nonlinear evolutions. So then uh, just to give you an overview, you start with some observations, you start, uh, and you know, specifically you all specify how the observations were obtained. You stick it into Borg and once you get our initial conditions, linear regime. Um, and, um, and of course, also the evolved universe today. Um, so this also reconstructs, for example, the dark matter distribution today. Uh, and it produces samples of those. Really, it produces samples of histories that are consistent with the observational constraints. Um, and you can use those, for example, to predict other quantities that you can then cross-correlate with. So this is a rich amount of data. The, the idea here, and maybe, I can anticipate a question in your mind. Um, sometimes I get asked this, why are we bothering with all these detailed 3D initial conditions? Um, why aren't we just going for the parameters like um, you know, the scalar spectral index or just the amplitude or, or FNL or something like that? Well, the reason is that typically um, in the history of this field, traditionally, uh, what has happened is people have taken summaries of the data, let's say the power spectrum or some other some count of objects or some summary of, of, the, of the observed data, and then have uh, constrained parameters based on those summaries. 
of course you never that this you know this is somewhat problematic because you never know whether you've you've exhausted the list of possible summaries or even whether you whether they're somehow optimal or is could always be some other new way of constraining these parameters and they're all interdependent of course and so you know a lot of his literature in the last <clears throat> decades in cosmology has been about oh look here's another thing you might observe um, and I'll, I'll mention some ideas uh, also in this talk but uh, here with Borg the idea is well let's not talk about these summaries let's talk about the entire thing and then we are sure that we model everything we okay, model all the interrelated all these summaries essentially are implicitly already taken into account including all of their correlations because we're really modeling everything at the level of the detailed um well, pretty fine-grained physics so <clears throat> here's a little movie i hope you can see that uh this just is supposed to illustrate um what this code does uh, you stick in observations on the right those are fixed those are a bunch of galaxies in the file you then uh you then run the sampler and you sample these initial conditions here and the final conditions. And so here in the final conditions, you see that there's a lot of structures that remain stable. And when something doesn't change here, it means that um, it means that uh, you know these are well constrained. When something changes a lot, that means that uh, we don't really know what's going on in those regions. So here in the lower right, there's an unobserved region. And so there are many different matter configurations that are consistent with that. But then here in the observed region, um, we clearly reconstruct the cosmic web. And this is a slice through a three-dimensional distribution of dark matter reconstructions. Um, and then here on the left, in the initial conditions, it's a little harder to see. But uh, these, again, sample around a set of initial conditions um, that give rise to this nonlinear matter distribution, which gives rise in the model to, to this galaxy. Um, so it's Galaxy Catalog. So if you want more information about this, um, you know, I invite you to go to this uh, website, the Aquila Consortium, which is an, a consortium that explores extensions of this and applications of this methodology uh, to various problems in astrophysics and cosmology. Um, Here's another example of the results. So because we this is a fully dynamical model, we also get velocity, we get predictions even for the velocity distribution for the dynamics of the galaxies. We stick in the galaxy catalog, but in fact, this model tells us something about where things are moving because we have a fully dynamical model for it. Um, so these, these are radial velocities in a slice through, uh, through the Sloan survey. Uh, and this is, by the way, this structure here is the Sloan Great Wall. And so you can see the inflow onto the Sloan Great Wall um, coming out of the model. So you can use these kinds of techniques then to debias. One application is to, to use this to debias H naught measurements from standard sirens, because these sirens are moving with the cosmic flow um, with peculiar velocities. And by taking galaxy catalogs like Sloan and, or, and other surveys, you can then compute what the posterior distribution of the peculiar velocity of a siren is uh, and use that to uh, debias H naught. And there's an example, we did this for a single uh, siren uh, in this paper. Uh, this is not very, doesn't change things very much at the individual object level, but once we have a significant number of sirens available, these peculiar velocity biases are going to matter and, and will give you a lot of scatter if you don't take them out. So is that it? Are we done? Problem solved? Is this uh, Borg is, is the answer and I can stop and take questions? Um, no. <laughs> these uh, these runs that I showed you there were actually for fixed fiducial cosmology. So I didn't vary the cosmological parameters. I did the initial condition reconstruction, which is a technically very challenging problem that we solved. But um, because the statistical power of this, because we're doing everything so fine grained, in such a fine grained way, uh, it's so enormous that um, the model of the data has to be extremely good so that the cosmological parameter inference um, is not dominated by systematics. And we're not there yet. Um, so what we need is the ability to put more reality in the data model. So not just have a um, bias model, which essentially transforms the dark matter field in some way and then says the galaxies sample that in some uh, with some statistics. Um, 
we need to have a better ability to mask and cut and project the data so that uh, we can, for example, on very small scales, so that um, we can become insensitive to remaining model error. So let's talk about what the challenges are here. Um, so learning cosmology from large scale structure, there are several challenges. Limited information, we only have one universe, so in large scales this has an impact and we need to model that correctly. Nonlinearity I already mentioned, um, which couples most of the available observable modes in the late universe, because they're, you know, as we're getting better data, we're looking at the smaller, smaller nonlinear scales. The fact that we observe traces and not the matter directly, um, so that those bias models uh, are really fairly simple that we have that we have access to, especially when you want to push to smaller scales. <laughs> the non-Gaussianity of everything <laughs> in this, if for this, you know, this not just slightly non-Gaussian, like for the cosmic microwave background, potentially when if the initial conditions are no, here everything is non-Gaussian. Um, you have large data sets which you don't really control because you're observing rather than setting things up in a lab. Um, and then you have systematics, which we, you know, which are you know, our systematics are other people's science. So there's there's actually interesting uh, interesting stuff that come out of this. These are contaminants, uh, instrumental and observational effects. So how do we deal with this? Um, it's probably not possible to you know to stick in something like illustrious or next generation uh, illustrious TNG into Borg and then run full hydro simulations and then run a photon simulation that tells you how the photons come in from all those galaxies and then run Borg in that context. It's just gonna be computationally to do this kind of ab initio physics-based model. That, that would probably give you the tightest possible confrontation of models and data. And it might still not, uh, it might still give you some biases, but then you learn about physics and then, you know, you learn how to improve the simulations. <clears throat> but Borg has a fully specified likelihood. Maybe that's too, that's um, not, uh, doesn't have enough flexibility. And so um, that's where machine learning comes in. So uh, one way to, to, to use machine learning directly in the context of Borg is to, say, okay, we can, we can model a bunch of physics, nonlinear dark matter distribution, but then uh, we'll put in a layer that translates the, this modeled physics into the observations. And there we say, okay, um, if you don't have, if you can't model all the hydrodynamics in that much detail, um, we'll just put an agnostic layer there. And we say, we put in symmetries that we know should apply, translation invariance, rotational invariance, uh, locality, causality. Um, and uh, and we use a function parameterized as a, as a neural network that maps to the data. Uh, and so we did this with the intent, you know, and, and um, uh, chose really a, the simplest possible way of doing this, I think, uh, which, which has only 17 parameters and use it as a, as a bias layer to mark, in, in this first instance, we tried this with halos. So we mapped the dark matter density to a halo statistics uh, the cool thing about this from a machine learning point of view is that we have a neural network that we do not train. We stick it into, uh, into this physical framework, and then we learn the parameters, the weights of the neural network from the data themselves. So it's by definition correct in the sense that you know, it's, not, it's not dependent on assumptions for what, went in, what recipes went into your hydro simulations. Um, now the question is, is it general enough? Um, it's, you know, this is, it, for this particular application, it works uh, very well. Um, and this is a Bayesian, fully Bayesian neural network where all the weights are treated as parameters, uh, where you're running Markov chains over networks um, and infer the cosmological initial conditions at the same time. So here is a movie of that running um, and the reference to the paper led by Tom Charnock. Um, postdoc here at, uh, at the Institute of Astrophysics. So here, what we're starting with is, um, here's the galaxy, is the halo distribution that we're modeling. Uh, here's, I'm showing not, not, not showing the initial conditions here. Um, I'm showing the dark matter reconstruction at redshift zero. And this is basically the dark matter is being translated into this halo distribution. And as and the model parameters of the neural network are getting fit now uh, to the data. And then on the right, 
this shows the result of the neural forward model that takes that dark matter reconstruction and pipes it through the, and these are learned at the same time, it pipes it through this bias layer, which you call a neural physical engine, um, because it has these constraints in there that makes it make it physical. Um, and you see that uh, now after a bunch of samples, uh, it has learned this distribution of halos and uh, the dark matter gets reconstructed. And the dark matter reconstruction, of course, has n-body simulations um, inside, the, inside it, right? So, this is, so the full model is initial conditions through n-body simulations and then translation to the halo distribution. And then on the right, you see the scattering here. This, this is the sampling of the, um, of the uh, parameters of the halos. Okay, so the num basically it says what, what number of halos with different masses are there in a cell with density delta. Um, so in this, uh, this is being adjusted as things go forward and, you, and the reconstruction is working. So this is an example for how to, how to make this robust. Even if we do improve the model, and I'm talk, I'll talk later about ideas and, and projects for, for doing that. If we put in hydro, hydro simulations, we make it a physical model of galaxies um, and not just the dark matter, um, there will inevitably still be some missing pieces. But then if you want to make it robust to get cosmological parameters, <clears throat> something like this, uh, like this kind of neurophysical engine, a very restricted kind of um, bias layer um, can absorb some of the differences and make the and actually make the inference robust. And this is this is the key. Okay. So <clears throat> maybe this is too much too fast. Um, I went straight into machine learning and and huge Bayesian Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and uh, zero shot learning. Um, I wanted to also tell you about some thought inspired by this really in terms of how do we make cosmological inference robust and yet take advantage of these very small scale modes where, all, where that we have a lot of right on the small scales we have we have a lot of these these very small scale modes with these upcoming high resolution data sets. And so geometric tests um, are typically robust. To model misspecification, right? If you're if you if you have a geometric test, the, the BAO, um, for example, you don't. Um, it's a it, you're just measuring a scale, or you're measuring, you know, it's not you're not you don't don't care too much about the properties of the galaxies. Um, it's something that's robust to the details, so this avoids having to model the full complexity of the data. So really, you can see here, you know, we have these very powerful techniques, and we'll talk about other techniques as well. But uh, at the same time, we're thinking about how to make the inferences robust because um, modeling everything is going to be difficult. Um, so let me take you back to cosmology 101. So you relax for a bit um, in this talk. Um, so when I started studying cosmology, now a very long time ago, I started, you know, chapter one is homogeneous and isotropic universe. Okay, very good. You know, Friedman, the metro of Robinson Walker metric. Um, you know, the Retardure equation. Um, chapter two is classical cosmological tests, okay? Typically the first one is luminosity distance redshift test. Um, and so what do you read? You read something like, I'm making this up, but you know, cosmology books look roughly like this. Uh, it says something like, observe an object's luminosity distance uh, and redshift, and then plot them against each other. Okay, this is how you do um, the luminosity distance redshift test that underlies, for example, the supernova or the standard sirens. Okay, I, I actually remember that this created some some cognitive dissonance for me when I first read this because I just learned that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, and nothing about perturbations had been said. And now I'm talking about objects, which clearly are not, you know, which which you, where you need perturbations to have objects in this uh, in this universe. So um, here's just a graphical representation of the same thing you know, redshifts, luminosity distance, cosmological parameters. Okay. So um, there are no objects in the homogeneous and isotropic universe. So what's going on? I mean, and uh, you need to consider structure really to do this. And somehow these 
the way that these classical tests are phrased is that you have sort of you think of these point particles and you don't really think about the structure and it turns out if you integrate that with what we know about structure formation and you know what we've learned in the last 50 years about how how structure in the universe is distributed it turns out you can get some really powerful um, generalizations of these classical tests okay so here's is a new way to think about these classical cosmological tests. Let's consider two types of traces of structure. One is a luminosity distance tracer, and let's call them call that with index SN, so like a supernova, for example, but could be um, mergers, uh, gravitational wave sirens, and a redshift tracer, so galaxies um, that we typically have in a spectroscopic survey. So let's write down the simplest possible model for the fields that they trace. Okay, so let's let's do a Gaussian random field. In fact, it won't matter. You can do better if it's non-Gaussian. I'll show you. But uh, even with just the assumption that it's Gaussian, you'll you'll see that you can do better than the standard test. So here's here's the uh, log likelihood. Okay, it's just a Gaussian random Gaussian field. I'm thinking now of delta as a 3D field, and and one is traced by you know, the galaxies trace one of them, the supernovas are trace you know tracing the other. Um, and they both obviously trace the underlying structure, right? In fact, they're going to be highly correlated to each other because supernovas go off in galaxies. So um, let's so here's that likelihood. So let's think about both of those. Both of those have there's structure in both of them, it clusters. And uh, let's think of them as, you know, let's say if they as transformed, you know, sort of stretched. Uh, versions of the of what they would have been in co-moving coordinates okay so you start with the structure in co-moving coordinates and then you transform it into the observational coordinates redshift and distance so z is the redshift co uh, transformation that takes and that obviously depends on cosmological parameters so it takes a bunch of voxels in co-moving and transforms them transforms that into a bunch of voxels in redshift and then D does the same thing for luminosity distance, makes a 3D field in luminosity distance. So then you can see that this covariance matrix now depends on the cosmological parameters through these transformations. Um, and we can use data that trace these fields to constrain these parameters. So what I, so I just said what these Zs are. So sorry, I actually had a picture for that. I forgot. Here it is, just the, shows you these co-moving coordinates mapped to, for example, redshift, but also distance. Okay, so um, what is this? Okay, so this thing there, the first, the upper left um, block of that covariance matrix is actually a global generalization of the Akopichinsky test. Uh, how does that come about? Well, Akopichinsky, I know, and, and you know, when I first uh, we first wrote about this or talked to people, people would always say, "Well, where is the ellipsoid?" Okay, Akopichinsky, that's it's an ellipsoid. Like if you don't have the right cosmological parameters and you map your galaxies into co-moving, then you get an ellipsoid. So where is that here? Well, here, this is actually generalized in the sense that we're not just looking at one single redshift slice, but we're looking at the entire light cone. You can just think of this as a 3D distribution uh, of um, traces of galaxies, and they all correlate with each other. And what we want to find when you do the inference is that set of cosmological parameters that uh, when you take them from redshift, map them to co-moving, isotropizes the distribution. Okay, that's really because this the zeta or, or sorry, psi gg is an isotropic uh, correlation because of the symmetries of the underlying um, model. Okay, um, and I'll talk. I'll get back to that later. So then the other block is actually something that, as far as I know, nobody's even had till now. So this paper came out uh, three years ago now almost. And even until now, nobody has actually tried this, um, even though this is in that paper, um, which is you can do the same thing, not in retrospace with galaxies, but in distance space with distance spaces, like supernovas, for example. Uh, and this will become very interesting when we'll have tens of thousands of supernovas uh, from LSST, for example. So these are, now we're doing transients, we're using transients to do cosmology. Uh, and uh, again, once we have lots and lots of gravitational wave mergers, uh, that's, this will be a source of information. But something that we can do now uh, is this multi-tracer 
multi-tracer or multi-probe test. So now we can look at these cross correlations and say, well, with galaxies and supernovas, both of them trace the same, you know, they trace each other to some extent, and they both trace the underlying matter. One is transformed in one way, the other was transformed the other way. So let's try to let's try to find the parameters of, of those two transformations such that they kind of overlap correctly. And not just that, but also uh, you get the information from isotropizing the correlations. Okay, so it's it's a little bit more than uh, than just saying particles, luminosity distance, redshifts go. So uh, it turns out you've sort of rediscovered this classical luminosity distance redshift test as a special case of this. Okay, so the class, the multi-probe test sums over all pairs of distance redshift tracers, whereas the classical test just goes, oh, here's a galaxy, a supernova went off in that galaxy. So let's try to um, let's try to use the redshift and the luminosity distance together to, to do cosmology. Um, sometimes people talk about these kind of statistical cross correlations, but what they typically mean are host identification. So you have a supernova that goes off, you find a nearby galaxy after the fact, and then you say, oh, the supernova probably went off in that galaxy. Um, but here we're talking, this is one level more because we're using the fact that everything is clustered, all the galaxies are clustered, the supernovas are clustered, and they're correlated to each other as well. Um, so with LSST, so here, let me just uh, go a little bit more quickly to what you can do with this. Um, here's, if you exploit this down to, um, let's say half a megaparsec, um, then you can, um, sorry, if you, sorry, if you, the other way around, if you exploit this down to about a megaparsec, um, then this is this green uh, contour, which is the forecast for what you can get in this in this uh, um, you know, dark, dark energy equation of state and and the change of the dark energy equation of state parameters, W naught, W A, uh, which you can see is actually better than what you what you would get if you had spectroscopic redshifts for um, for all of your uh, supernovas, and that's because you're taking into account this correlation information and the isotropy, you know, isotropy information as well. Um, but uh, even if you even if you just have um, so if you, the typical way, if you, so with these fifty thousand supernovas, the problem is that uh, it's very hard to go back and find redshifts for every single one of them. Um, and so the thing is, you don't need to because fifty thousand supernovas and twenty million galaxies that we'll have from DESI um, together actually constrain the cosmological parameters much better and you don't need to get the redshifts of the supernovas you just need to you, you can use this correlation information and that actually does the job for you and better because you're also taking into account these cross correlations um, why we cut this off at one megaparsec is purely not to shock every shock people too much because um, uh, you know the, this correlation will extend to much much smaller scales because yes supernovas go off in galaxies and so gal galaxies are smaller than one megaparsec so it's quite probable that, that this could be pushed to even smaller scales because we don't need to understand how galaxies how galaxies cluster or how supernovas cluster we just need to understand that they're correlated with each other okay. and and basically doing the classical test with host identification just amounts to ignoring these correlations altogether um, for the cosmological parameters. So here's um, a more recent paper where we show an uh, application of this to uh, what we can do with dark sirens, um, you know, with 50, 100, 200 uh, dark sirens and what this implies for constraints on H0, uh, references down there. Um, so this basically means roughly that with 200 gravitational events without EM counterparts, so without redshifts, uh, we should be able to reach the same precision on H naught as the shoes measurement. So this is key because the ones with EM counterpart, the neutron star mergers, seem to be relatively rare. So this may, we might, may get there sooner than what we need, the 50 we, um, neutron star mergers that we would need. Okay, so this geometrical approach seem, is very robust. We don't really need to model this, the correlations um, we need to really don't we really need to know what the correlations are? We just need to know that they're there and exploit them for this cosmology for this cosmological test. Uh, and the better we model them, the better the test will be. But it's not going to bias the results. Um, so can we use this with Bohr? Can we now take this insight and put it back into this three D field model, um, which does it, which starts with Gaussian initial conditions, but actually now has a fully nonlinear model 
of the final distribution. Okay, so um, instead of now looking at uh, the parameters, for example, for the power spectrum, we can borg to keep cosmological parameter dependence only in the coordinate mapping of galaxies from redshift space to co-moving space. Okay, so galaxies observed in redshift, and we sort them into co-moving, which is where our simulations live. And so we just use that that mapping. So this Z transform that no, Z Z operator that I had in the on the previous slide uh, to do Akok Pachinsky now. It's the upper left box block of that made covariance matrix, but now not Gaussian. Yeah, no, with, with all the modes, all the higher order moments uh, on the light cone. So it's that block there. Um, and this is explored in this paper here by um, by former student Cody Dugesh Cody Ramana. Um, and here you see this the change of variables. So here is the retro space, this is the co-moving space, and this is clearly not homogeneous. Uh, this is homogeneous because of the because of the transformation. There's only about one point. This is isotropic everywhere, and so you're using that. And you know, also notice that these fields are not in the cosmic web, and it's, and you're reconstructing the cosmic web. <clears throat> so um, skipping over a lot of technical detail, here's what can hope to get okay so uh here's the summary plot uh this is what you would get with the bao analysis or what has now been obtained with bao analysis um but this is the fisher matrix prediction which matches roughly what's actually been obtained from sloan uh, from the sloan uh from the boss data and this little ellipsoid here is what you can get by exploiting this uh, just this ap test okay in this in the in the equation of state omega matter plane uh, so this says how much information is available there um, and again this does not use the shape of the power spectrum it just uses the fact that the matter is correlated and uh and, and the fact that you, and it does basically there's an ap test not just at the two-point level but at all point endpoint levels because we have this non-linear uh, model for the density distribution and this and this tests on there actually show this on simulations and show that uh, we get reconstructions that that are within these um with that satisfy these constraints and what you find is that um so borg has a whole bunch of parameters that parameter parameterize bias and and the surveys uh, and just different galaxy populations in the surveys uh, which are all these parameters here and here are the two cosmological parameters that, that we're showing and you see that they actually decouple um very, very strongly from those because um, we're only using the geometrical information. Uh, and the fact that our model is not perfect doesn't matter because it's it's good enough. Okay, so this was some, uh, you know, we talked about the geometry, geometric measures, linked it back into Borg. Let's talk about solving the full problem again. Uh, change color scheme. Okay, here we go. Um, so the full problem, we need more freedom, you know, than in the sort of fully likelihood specified code like Borg. I talked about making it robust. I talked about geometry, uh, but uh, let's see if there are other ways. So let's say we really want freedom to make our physical model anything we want. We want freedom to um, do to our data anything we want. So. Um, Typically, for example, making nonlinear cuts to data makes likelihood analysis really complicated. Um, but it would be very, very convenient if you could do that. So, uh, if you have if you have dust distribution in the sky, you discover that in your data and you take out points based on that. But that's a nonlinear cut; it's difficult to model in the likelihood. <clears throat> so, you want this this freedom, and this is much easier to do. So, these forward models, these are much more much much easier to simulate than to derive an accurate likelihood given you know a hydro code or really complicated data cuts so uh, let's now say okay let's say we can simulate the data maybe not perfectly so we'll have like i said robustness um, but let's say you know, we get as close as possible simulating the data but we don't know how to write down the full likelihood description like we did with borg how can we analyze data if all we can do is simulate it 
Um, and so here's just a mathematical representation of that is Bayes theorem. This is what we want to do. We want to get parameters given data. This is the likelihood. Um, and let's say we don't have a form, we can't write down the likelihood because it's too complicated, but we are able to draw simulations of data given parameters. So we're able to simulate or we draw from the likelihood. We don't know how to write it down, but we can simulate, which means we're able to draw from the likelihood. So then uh, this, uh, these, these very nice people here have, <laughs> have contributed massively to, uh, to, to actually realizing this and uh, developing the uh, underlying concepts. Um, and, um, and so let me tell you how we, can, how we can do this without writing down a likelihood. So by the way, simulation-based and likelihood-free in my mind are synonymous. Likelihood free does not, it's, it's a, maybe a bit of a misnomer. It doesn't mean that there is no likelihood. In fact, the likelihood is there. It's just, you don't write it down. And it just means that you simulate something. And so implicitly you define the likelihood by your simulation code, okay? That makes it very flexible. So you have a bunch of parameters that you want to infer from the data. You then simulate, for example, a galaxy distribution. You then, uh, so that's your simulated, you then extract some information from that simulation and then uh, that's your simulated data and you ask, are those the same? Okay, so in, in Bayesian speak, it's you draw from your prior, from your parameters, you simulate the data and then you have some way of saying, well, if my simulated data exactly matches the true data, then I accept, else I reject. And if you were able to do that, then the parameters, that, you, that give rise to simulated data that exactly match where all the galaxies are in the universe that you know, we observe, um, then you're sampling from the true posterior, those, those theaters you retain. So obviously that will happen very rarely. If you're doing a 3D distribution of the galaxy mock, it's basically impossible for all of those to match up with the real galaxies in our universe because it's an unconstrained simulation, unlike Borg where we're doing constrained simulation. Um, so you introduce an epsilon here. So the, basically saying, you know, as, as long as this is close enough, I'll accept. And so then you degrade the constraints a little bit, but uh, at least in the limit, you know, you're doing the right thing. <clears throat> so the question then is how do we get down the dimensionality of the data space? Because otherwise we'll never get good matches, the simulations to the actual. Um, um, so let's talk about that. And it turns out we can do that by compressing. Okay, so if you find the right kind of compression, and I said before, traditionally cosmology is all about, be, has been all about finding physical ways of compressing the data to the power spectrum, for example, or other quantities, other statistics. So here, <clears throat> what this is a bit of conceptual stuff that we're actually already doing to some extent, but I'll show you in a minute how we can actually make sure that the compression we compute, we let, we let essentially artificial intelligence find ways to compress the data which contain all of the available information. So we're sure, uh, at least at the level that we trust the machine learning, we're sure that we're getting all the information out. So let's say you have your parameters, you simulate large amount of data, and then you summarize that into a large number of summaries. So it could be anything you want to compute from the data, voids, uh, power spectrum, bi spectrum, and you know, computation function, anything you want number counts okay and then it turns out you can always find ways to compress any number of summar summary statistics into only n compressed statistics where n is the number of parameters you started with so this is key because it means that if you want to constrain five parameters you only need to work in a five-dimensional space of the data you just have to find which one so this is explained in in these papers That's the information inequality this is um, using you know, Kramer-Rao theorem, okay, uh, and and you know, expected information. So, all right. So that let's say we we're able to do that. How do we explore the parameter space, though? Okay, so now we have the compressed data. How do we compare the data to the parameters when we don't have a likelihood? And uh, again, machine learning comes to the rescue here because it turns out we can learn the likelihood from the forward simulations. Um, so we use it, use the basically learn the probability density of the parameters and the compressed data. Because the data are compressed, this is lower dimensional and it's possible. And this is described in this paper down there. Okay, so here's, here's just a 
<coughs> let me not go into the details. This is a particular problem in supernova cosmology where it turns out that with about a thousand forward simulations of supernova light curves or supernova you know, observed magnitudes, we can compress down. And for this case, we actually know what the likelihood is. We can, you know, we can do also do the typical Markov chain Monte Carlo. This is with five parameters. And uh, here we're showing a very, very, very long run Markov chain Monte Carlo of the known, known posterior. And what we can get out of about a thousand simulations of the data with these methods, where, the, where, the, where this then learns the, uh, the likelihood. Okay, so um, this works for a handful of parameters, maybe 10 parameters. In many cases, you have nuisance parameters in your experiments that um, there could be many more, but it turns out you can take that into account um, you know, using some tricks that we described in that paper. <clears throat> then uh, the way we model the likelihood is also in terms of machine learning. So we use neural density estimators, in particular we're using uh, normalizing flows. Um, and um, and then I said I just said that this works well with up to you know let's say up to ten parameters, roughly speaking. Um, but what if we really want to push it to much higher numbers of parameters, maybe tens or hundreds of parameters? Well, it turns out rather than actually getting a full joint distribution of, of all, you know, the full posterior out, we can, if we just focus on getting uh, some moments of the posterior or low dimensional posterior marginals, which is typically all we look at in any case. Um, we've showed in this, this paper, which was presented at NeurIPS last year, um, how to do this. And I'll show you just really quickly some examples. So here, uh, this is called moment networks. So these are networks that just learn from data how to compute posterior moments. So moments of the posterior distributions that you, that you want to obtain uh, for the parameters. So here's some example data, gravitational wave data, a, a merger simulation with LIGO noise, uh, two different cases. Okay, this is a chirp. Um, and here on the left, you see uh, a single shot, so there's no sampling going on. So you train a network with a bunch of simulations, in this case, uh, about 30,000 simulations, 35,000, I think. Um, and you train the network uh, to, you, by specifying the loss, you can train the network to give you the mean and variance of the posterior for every one of the parameters. And each parameter essentially here is a, is a, is a moment in time, okay? The value of the strain at a moment in time. So here's the, the green is the simulation ground truth. The data here you can see scatters around this. And uh, this band gives you the uh, a single shot output from these from this moment from these moment networks. Um, so there's no sampling going on whatsoever. And so does this do the right thing? The, on the right here, we have a very similar kind of problem, but a case where there is an analytical form for the likelihood and the posterior that we can sample from. So we run along again, run MCMC. And you see the, the green lines here uh, are what you expect from the, from the known truth. And the moment work trained moment network gives you in a single shot, just looking at the data, boom, gives you this without any sampling. So the, the amount of computation here is in generating the simulations to train the network. Whereas on the Markov chain Monte Carlo side, the amount of computation is evaluating the likelihood many times as you're sampling in the parameter space. Okay, so um, this is for hundred about hundred parameters, hundred twenty eight parameters here. Um, here, this is some fresh off the. Uh, this is from today, actually. This is uh, Niall. Uh, tried this out. This is ten minutes on a GPU uh, and about an hour or two of, of Niall's time, uh, taking foreground dust simulations, um, a temperature map of the cosmic microwave background, adding foreground and then training a neural network, tra training a moment network to give you the mean posterior reconstruction of the temperature from this obscured. This is without any frequency dependence. So this is a single map, foreground obscured, guess, that, guess the mean posterior. And you can see that uh, this, is, uh, this, this is very close to the ground truth. And the whole point of this is that it gives you error bars because you can train all the moments of the posterior. So here is the data again, the mean posterior mean, same as on the previous, but here are the posterior variances. So this, it's very interesting is that you, because this learns the non-Gaussian nonlinear model, um, as opposed to, for example, a Wiener filter, which would not do this, um, 
at least in its standard form, you can see that uh, the variance depends on the value of the parameter of the foreground and that, you know, and of course it doesn't know this, it only knows this obscure data. So you can see that the um, reconstruction variance here uh, is, you know, follows the structure of the foreground. So it discovers uh, this implicitly and it's just, and again, this is a single, the training took about 10 minutes for this case. And this is now, now we're talking tens of thousands of Okay, um, I think I'm almost out of time. So uh, let me skip quickly about over this part, um, which is uh, I, I, something I mentioned, I was saying, uh, can you still hear me? It says my internet is unstable, is it okay? It was a bit choppy, but uh, now it's okay. Okay, all right, good. Um, so this is how to get summaries of the data that that are maximally informative and we call these information maximizing neural networks again work um, led by Tom Charnock and uh, with Guillaume Laveau also at IAP um, and I'm not going to go into the details I'll just show you an, an example application so here we have um, a bunch of simulated correlated uh, um, lens weak lensing signals uh, we mask them, we add noise, um, sort of somewhat Euclid inspired noise, um, and add mask. And, uh, and then we compress them first into power spectra. Okay. But those have very non Gaussian distributions. And so then we ask, how can we use those power spectra and compress those down into a small number of parameters? So the power spectra have hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of, um, numbers, okay, but to do with this likelihood free inference, we need maybe five or ten, five to ten, you know, then however many parameters we want to constrain. We want to get the number of summary statistics down to that level. And so we use information maximizing neural networks. And uh, so this is the first time that we can do um, a weak lensing analysis with a non Gaussian lensing potential all the way down to the full posterior. So, this is uh, with a non Gaussian model for the weak lensing potential. And this was uh, two years ago now. And actually, uh, um, uh, Cora, I think, is on the call, has, uh, has done similar work um, recently using similar ideas. Okay, so. Um, this is simulation based, but if we want to do simulation based inference, we need all these simulations. How do we, how, how are we going to get all these really realistic hydro simulations of large bits of the universe uh, or even just n body simulations? So, again, there are a number of advances here that give me hope that we can do it. Um, Florent Leclerc uh, recently um, led a paper showing that we can perfectly parallelize n-body simulations. So we can take a large box, gigaparsec box in this case, split it up into pieces that are 60 or 125 megaparsecs each, and just run independent little n-body simulations in those and stitch them back together <clears throat> using um, using what we, using the um, ideas of, um, essentially use, using a, a spatial version of what drives the COLA algorithm, okay, the COLA um, fast n-body sims. Um, how do we get the numbers of simulations down um, to for, for the predictions? Uh, here's a paper led by a student of mine, Nicolas Chartier, um, which we called carpool, so convergence acceleration by regression and pool, regression and pooling. So this is a um, a new way to, uh, for example, for the cosmological for the power spectrum matter power spectrum. Here you can see that with just five n-body runs. Uh, we can get much, much better, um, in fact, on large scales, much better, and then on small scales, equivalent results to 500 uh, n-body runs, so a factor of 100 reduction. And what makes this work is that uh, we have not just these high resolution simulations or high quality simulations, but it turns out by using fast approximate simulations that are biased themselves, we can combine those with the presumably unbiased or high quality simulations uh, to reduce the stochastic error and and get and, you, and then run much smaller number of them which means that uh, this becomes much more feasible to to actually push the physical modeling in these in the full simulations 
So that's this paper here. Um, training these algorithms, uh, you need, you know, we need to play with, with lots of data so that the Quixote simulations uh, run, uh, the collaboration run by um, Paco Villascusa Navarro. Um, which are 43,000 gadget full simulations, one gigaparsec, not super high res resolution, but you know, already it's about a petabyte of data. And so this is an excellent tool for studying the statistics of dark matter um, and, uh, and to train machine learning uh, surrogates, um, for example, to, to generate fast in-body simulations. So for example, we use this to go from a low resolution n-body run to a high resolution n-body run, super resolving using, uh, again, deep learning techniques. In this particular case, uh, Wasserstein um, generative adversarial network, um, which basically from initial conditions, you run a fast, I mean, a low resolution n-body simulation, and then super resolve it uh, using a bunch of you know, high resolution initial conditions and uh, in the Wasserstein gun. And then the reference full high resolution simulation is here. You can see it's uh, statistically uh, equivalent at the level. And then uh, CAMELS is, is a, um, a project again led by Paco um, where we're uh, collaborating with uh, people in hydro, yeah, the, you know, experts in hydro simulations and bringing the machine learning expertise to um, to train and validate these machine learning surrogates um, and, uh, and with the goal of being able to drive these the simulation based inference. So there's the summary, I'm a few minutes over, but we did start about five minutes late. So um, <laughs> uh, I'll let you read that. Um, and most importantly, um, here are all the codes <laughs> or the websites um, that you can go to to get for more information. Um, I don't know if these slides will become available, but um, you can go there and go back to the summary slide. If you agree, we would uh, post your slides on our website afterwards. Cool. Uh, thank you. Great. So thanks, Ben, for the very nice talk. Uh, are there questions? Uh, Sven. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, thanks a lot yes, for a very nice talk. Uh, so I have a question on the um, super resolution with GANs. You had somehow um, uh, some error measure of like 1% accuracy or so. So my question is essentially, um, um, yeah, how much do you, can you trust these GAN simulations in the sense of, uh, yeah, how, how do you measure the accuracy? How uh, you, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, so, we looked at, so the, the details that we looked at uh, the, the power spectrum of the forward of the simulate of the super resolved and body simulations and, and we're talking about the density fields here that, that come out the dark matter density fields um, and we looked at the cross correlation of the um, of the forward simulated uh, density fields with the high resolution simulations um, that we trained on actually the oh, the other thing I should mention is that this works with a single uh, some pair of to train, right? So you basically have a single simulation, high resolution simulation, corresponding low resolution simulation, and the uh, high resolution um, and low resolution initial conditions. Um, and that's enough to train the network. Um, so, you that, so that means you don't have to run hundreds of thousands or you know, thousands of simulations to, to train the simulation um, because of the structure that we impose on the network. Um, architecture. Um, so, uh, and we also looked, for example, at uh, void statistics uh, and um, and the bispectrum. And so those were um, within uh, within tolerance, you know, at the sort of 1% level. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm obviously like, like this kind of approaches very much, but it's a, there are always a lot of people doing n-body simulations who are kind of typically skeptical about any machine uh, using machine learning or using using GANs. Um, mm -hmm. But you, your experience is in some sense that, okay, so by looking at uh, standard 
statistical yeah, measures of like looking at on the power spectrum, et cetera, I can kind of say, oh, that's a measure of, I can trust the, uh, these simulations. Yeah, I mean, I understand that there's some hesitation. It's, it's actually, maybe I can tell a very short story. Uh, I organized a three month um, so a trimester at the uh, Institute, at the Henry Poincaré Institute in Paris um, when such things were still possible. And um, the, <laughs> And in the, there was one part was which was about simulation. So one was about uh, theory. There was a part about um, analysis, and there was a part about uh, simulations. And uh, I, in one of the discussion sessions, I asked the audience, um, "So who here is looking at machine learning techniques uh, to accelerate their simulations, or to, you know, to uh, to push forward?" And nobody raised their hand. It was very interesting, and I, I waited quite a long time. Okay, you know, I know the people. You know, take a while to 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 raise their hands. Uh, nobody raised their hand. Um, and then we started talking about various other things. And then in the discussion, it emerged that well, actually all of them <laughs> are using some form of machine learning um, uh, to to accelerate uh, one thing or another, uh, or at least thinking about it. Um, I guess they weren't quite ready yet to to claim that it was working, but uh, they were all interested because it's just so powerful. Now, you know, I, yes, caution is definitely, um, uh, you should apply caution and, uh, with these methods. Um, I think it's very important to think about the network architecture carefully, um, to think about uh, validation very carefully, and, um, you know, and to set up the applications in such a way that uh, the outcome does not depend necessarily on having um, a network that generalizes absolutely everything to, to all cases. Um, so for example, in the likelihood free inference case, when we're doing, we have these forward simulation path and we have the data path, okay? So basically the idea is that you treat the data, you simulate the physics and then you treat everything just exactly the same as you treat the data. And then at the end, you have a compression step. So the simulation part and the compression step, um, they're, they're um, so essentially, so certainly the compression step is in the same is happening exactly the same way in the two paths. So if the compression step does something weird, it does it the same way to the data as it does it to your model. And so the worst thing that can happen is that you you lose power, but but you don't get biased. Now it's a bit different for the simulations because if the simulations are wrong, uh, the data are right by definition. So um, so there we have to um, just rely on typical you know standard tests. Uh, to validate that the simulations are within uh, the necessary accuracy, um, um, but on the so the the opposite uh, point of view is you know it's a, it gets a bit uh, conspiracy theory uh, style you know if essentially all of the statistics you're checking um, show that things are working yeah. uh, and then to decide not to use it because uh, there's some you know you're wondering about yeah maybe on that particular initial condition, you trigger some crazy outlier. I think you would probably notice. Any, any other questions? So I have one. So uh, you emphasize that instead of working with the summaries of data, like the endpoint functions, it's uh, advantageous to go directly with the initial conditions. Um, in your new cosmological inference approach, is there a way to take advantage of or discover small numbers, small parameters? Like the fact that we expand it to endpoint functions because the perturbations are small mm. and the power spectrum is almost scale invariant, so n is minus one is close to zero. And is, is there a way to sort of get such information from your approach? Interesting. Yeah. So, um... Only in a very, you know, there's a, I could make an analogy, but it's not really the same. So um, it, in this, so this, um, let me go back to this carpool stuff. Um, so here we're able to run, to, so the way this paper is phrased is it says, okay, let's say you have some heavy um, simulation, nonlinear, um, that's that takes a long time to run, but you want to know what the theoretical prediction is of that model uh, without all the scatter on it. Okay, so how do you do that uh, in an unbiased way? 
Um, but then you have some other way of running, uh, of doing this prediction, um, which is not as uh, accurate. But can I use combine these two together somehow and do you know run a lot of these fast, um, biased and inaccurate simulations and sort of and somehow use that to accelerate the convergence of the slow ones. Um, and actually, here we're using so one you know what we're actually using for the for the uh, fast simulations are Kohler ones. So Kohler uses Lagrangian perturbation theory. Uh, so we're using the fact that gravity on large scales uh, is perturbative mm -hmm. and um, and we're pushing uh, and, and um, we're using that to do these approximate uh, simulations and then we, and we can use that to sort of bootstrap off of that in order to reduce the, to cast the error on these n body simulations. So I mean another way to think about this paper is to say you know, what is more, I mean, I'm going to get into hot water now, but um, let me phrase it in a really um, polemic way, and I don't really mean it, okay, but <laughs> let, me, let me just say it. Um, you know, what is better? Um, a very large number of theorists working for decades, uh, pushing perturbation theory, you know, um, to, you know, to end loops um, and taking into account all kinds of terms um, you know, uh, in various paradigms of perturbation theory, Lagrangian, Eulerian, um, now there's uh, effective field theory, which introduces parameters. I mean, you know, there's, yes, there's a, there's an intellectual beauty about analytical work, um, but, um, you know, I could, I could portray it, you know, again, now polemically, uh, as, you know, saying that that is a huge amount of effort with a small, you know, with, with a bunch of people, different groups that, that disagree with each other, sometimes for years until they find out how the terms, you know, the various approaches can connect to each other and so forth. Um, when in fact you have accurate n-body simulations right there that compute everything to infinite order. I mean, not perturbatively actually. Um, and all you need to do is just increase the resolution to to push the k scale way that you trust. Um, so it's just a question of computational time. So several extremely intelligent, uh, ingenious uh, versus running a supercomputer for you know a week, let's say, if you really push it. Mm -hmm. um, so. It, so in this and in this paper we say well okay so maybe you, if you want to really do the best job you can you don't you you and it takes a week to run you can't really run it 500 times to get the theoretical you know something that is where the error bar is much smaller than the theoretical error bar you get from from the other the other approach so then just you know so but here we're getting to the point where with just a few of those runs you're essentially getting a scatter free theoretical prediction out of an n-body code, mm -hmm. plus a whole bunch of other, you know, perturb and that the perturbation goes into making these fast surrogates that that you then use to. So so it's um, so it is it, so this approach is in some ways inspired by by the perturbative approach, uh, but thinks about how to how to do that on in in the non-perturbative numerical way. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I would imagine things like features in the power spectrum would be much more, much better using your approach than, than calculating them because there's so many different possibilities. Right. I mean, so for example, if let's say you have a whole bunch of, uh, I agree, and, and uh, uh, let's say you have, you want to explore other kinds of theories. You, let's say you work hard to, to then add, uh, add another parameter, let's say modify gravity, uh, you know, some other interaction. Yeah. Between, you know, um, for your for your n-body code, um, well, but you've already got all these n-body runs that you've done uh, in the past for, at the at the standard model. Well, mm -hmm. use those to reduce you know as the approximate ones. So you only need to do a few runs of your generalized code to get basically zero variance or very small variance results that are, you know, that you can tell you what mm -hmm. the answer is. Right. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Let me let me say again. I don't. I'm not against theoretical work. Quite the opposite. I'm uh, strongly in favor of it. But uh, <laughs> you know. But but I guess it, at some point you start losing insight as well when it comes. You know, get to the two loop level and there are huge mm -hmm. numbers of terms and you're doing. You know, 
it's the argument that that analytical work really adds to the insight at some point i think becomes weaker mm -hmm. as you're pushing further down the line mm -hmm. right so i don't see any other questions since we are already getting late for ben so i'm really hoping not to end on this point <laughs> i don't know <laughs> <laughs> Your timing is perfect. It's exactly an hour. Well, I can, I, I can ask another question if you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe the last question from Sven. <laughs> so, <laughs> we don't have to end on this note. Uh, so like, one thing is always uh, when we play around with, with uh, you know, simulations or with data, it's resolution. Um, uh, is there like, um, so what's, what's your kind of, favorite strategy in some sense because like as one is obviously you could go to larger resources or um you can compromise a little bit on your um uh, yeah on your accuracy um yeah do you have something in like when i think about the weak lensing pictures and so that you were showing right i mean it always depends a little mm -hmm. bit on what what you want to um like have you got an optimal okay. or have you got a favorite uh, recipe for uh, for uh, which resolution you, you're picking i mean i think you know it, it's a, i would say that using um you know you use smart ways to reduce the variance on your simulations i think that's one one aspect um, um for weak lensing you want to push to very very high i mean you want to push to very, very small scales. At the same time, that's where baryonic effects become important. But maybe you don't need to run those simulations. Maybe you don't. So in this other paper, for example, we show that you don't really need to run very large volumes. <clears throat> um, you can decouple things. So you can just really run small, smaller simulations uh, to extremely high resolution and then, and then patch them together. Um, so which takes advantage of modern computational architecture. So I think that's, those kinds of ideas um, can hopefully help with this. Okay. So um, since it's getting late and you already answered quite a number of questions, uh, so let's thank uh, Ben again and let's stop the recording.